In this session, we will try to explore one of the, the uh, certainly most fascinating areas of uh, high-tech industry and the most fascinating area of the financial services. And for that, we have uh, our team of experts. Uh, we have uh, Advocate Amber Dolman of uh, Goodwin Proctor LLP from uh, the city of Champions, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, she's uh, a partner at the financial industry practice and co-leader of the firm's uh, fintech practice. She advises in the securities law aspects of compensation also, which is one of the most lucrative uh, profitable areas of our uh, practice. And she is recognized by some uh, legal uh, journals as one of the rising uh, stars of the cold uh, New England uh, skies. We have uh, uh, Jacob Enoch from uh, the Tel Aviv firm of Empiron & Co. Uh, he's the head of uh, M&A department of the firm and he's one of the uh, surviving Renaissance people of uh, our generation that can master both transactional side and litigation side and still are recognized in, as a leading uh, practitioner in uh, each of this, uh, those sides. We have uh, uh, Jay Kalish, who is the, uh, coming from our beloved uh, capital city of Jerusalem, who is the general counsel of our crowd, which is, uh, if somebody uh, doesn't know, is a crowdfunding platform focused on Israeli startups. Uh, and he's actually, in, in his profession, both of the modern and, and old dreams of the Yiddish Mame, becoming a lawyer and an entrepreneur, are uh, melting into one position, which is uh, general counsel of a uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, tech uh, company. Uh, uh, Jay was involved in many of the uh, technology uh, companies, NASDAQ-listed uh, companies, mainly on issues of uh, investor-relating aspects of, uh, of, uh, of those companies, and uh, he took his uh, many years of experience into this uh, new uh, venture. Uh, we have from uh, the capital of the free world, from the DC, Eitan uh, Levinson from the uh, firm of uh, Covington and Burling LLP, and uh, formerly a formidable attorney at the, uh, one of, uh, the CFBP, one of the uh, regulators of the financial services at the prayer uh, WhatsApp area, of course, I believe. You didn't use WhatsApp for your services in the past. Uh, so, and today he's uh, switch-sided and, uh, and uh, advising companies on an ongoing basis with regard to uh, regulatory aspects of uh, new products and also God forbid if they have something to do with enforcement, so we help them to survive uh, this process. Last and certainly not least, we have uh, Advocate Zach Lichtblau from the firm of Bonard and Lawson uh, in uh, Shanghai. Uh, Zach, which is a Mandarin speaker, which is alone, just you know, I don't have to say nothing anymore, which is uh, <laughs> difficult enough, assisting international company to survive the uh, terra incognita of uh, corporate and business law in China. So our first uh, issue today would be uh, fintech with or against the uh, current players, mostly the bank but uh, other. So Amber, in your experience uh, as a transactional lawyer in the area of financing and financial services, do you see the new players as uh, Try to think about the future. Will they kill the current industry in the way that Tower Records has been disappeared some decade ago? Or will it have like a giant, uh, a giant uh, uh, war between two, uh, two uh, big players, uh, think about Walmart versus Amazon? Or just new companies uh, which will try to fill in some gaps of non-bank areas, some areas which are not served by current uh, uh, players. So, what is your take on that? I, I mean, I think it's probably going to be mostly the latter, um, and that the the world's going to look a lot like it does today. Um, you know, when we think of fintech, we often get the 
the tech view of the two guys in a garage, but the banks are fintech companies, and they're some of the fin first fintech companies, um, and they're doing a lot of what the technology and pharmaceutical companies did 10, 15, 20 years ago, which is they realized that they were maybe not so good at innovating internally, and they let the small companies go out there and innovate for them, and they fund them, do joint development agreements, get a foot in the door, test them out, and when they get to a certain level, they'll snap them up and bring that technology internally. And we've seen a lot of major players in the US and throughout the world doing that, um, because ultimately the banks are not gonna survive without incorporating more and more FinTech into what they're doing. Um, so there's gonna be disruptors out there, but I think the bulk of the FinTech companies and solutions that we see out there are assisting rather than disrupting the banks. Uh, Jay, uh, our crowd effectively is trying to eliminate some of the uh, intermediary in the uh, uh, investing uh, uh, market. So do you see yourself as a competition to current VCs or as, again, trying to fill in some gap of small investments of uh, ordinary people for startup, which uh, in turn try uh, find it difficult to, uh, to find a way into the uh, current industry? I think to answer that question, I'd really, let me just take a couple of minutes to describe what we've done and how we've changed the model on, on the venture capital side. When we first started up, our founder, our visionary, John Medved, we sat in his basement. There were six of us five and a half years ago. Um, we had the board meetings in the dining room and we had the outside meetings in the, in the uh, cafe down the block. And when we first started, we were doing small investments, three hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 in A round funding. And we were seen as a fringe player, just a, a nice little thing that was happening. We were an outlier. But as the number of accredited investors in our base grew, we suddenly became, a, we became more of a force. And then we became more than a nuisance. We, started, we had to now show people why we had added value. So what we were able to do is, first of all, our model is to democratize venture capital. If you wanted to invest in private companies, unless you had the several million dollars to invest in a venture capital fund, you could not get into these deals. And our question was, how do you democratize that so that an investor, an angel, an angel investor who is an accredited investor, which is a legal term, could, it, could build their own portfolio in private equity, just like they have public equities, and what we were able to do is develop a model where we aggregate both angel investors, maybe family offices, et cetera, who invest a minimum of $10,000 in portfolio companies, and we aggregate them into a single vehicle, and these investors get the same rights as the venture, as the venture capital funds. So at first we were seen as a threat, we were seen as something that wasn't very, very, wasn't very helpful, and we were competitive. But what we've added to this is a whole, the whole idea of using our crowd to help our, 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 our portfolio companies. Today we have some 20,000 accredited investors. We've raised, over the past five years, we've raised over $500 million for some 140 portfolio companies. We now have 140 employees worldwide. And one of the things we've done now is we've, we're using our network to help our portfolio companies. So if a portfolio company wants to meet with company X, they can throw that out to our, to our crowd. And, more, and I could say, when, since we've launched this part of the le website three months ago, over 1,000 meetings have been set up to date. We actually had one deal where we were um, told, if you'd like to get into the deal, show us that your model works. Here are the six companies we want to meet. And within a week, that happened. And now we were, and we were able to be in the deal. So these are some of the things we're doing. I, I wouldn't say that we're going to replace the venture capital models, but we do have a place with the major VCs. We invest alongside them. You name, if you name the major name, we are investing with them. And we think this is just another part of the landscape and not necessarily something to displace what's out there today. Thank you. Uh, Zach, whenever I meet people who spend some time in China, they're really fascinating about the uh, level of penetration of fintech into the uh, retail daily use uh, of the market in China. And one of the best examples is WeChat, WeChat Pay, as it's called. Everybody told me, we never use any other methods of payments whenever it comes to mm -hmm. convenience store, paying to another friend of uh, small debt. So uh, my question is, what are the reasons in China behind the, uh, what are the motives or 
what if the infrastructure, the unique uh, infra infrastructure in China that helps those companies to flourish yeah. and why you cannot find the same experience in other jurisdictions? Um, I, I think that, first of all, it's, it's, uh, maybe, it's not uh, that sorry, the only... Maybe if you can describe yeah. you know, uh, WeChat yeah. to you, maybe to the... Uh, WeChat is not the only choice, uh, and it's mainly, it would be WeChat or Alipay, Trifubao, I'm wondering. <laughs> and um, it's, um, these two payment solutions have just, they, they've taken over the market, but um, I think that to go back a little bit to the, to, to, um, to the first question that you asked about the fintech being a, a disruptor or a, a supporter or both, I would say that the, the banking system in China needed some serious disrupting. Um, every time we had to compare for our clients, like what is it like to do to bank in China compared to banking services in other countries, you feel that it's just so much difficult to deal with the banks on the regular basis. Um, and, uh, and the fintech companies really helped the market in a way leapfrog because the, the, the banking system was just so far behind the rest of the world. Uh, I'm talking still, you know, if, uh, if, um, if we receive uh, money from overseas, I need to send somebody to the bank physically. Um, we need to send people with chops to, to operate our bank account. This doesn't, doesn't happen elsewhere. Um, and yet fintech was there, uh, the, the, I would say the, the main uh, uh, companies that, that pushed it, uh, I could say were uh, WeChat and Alipay, um, so it's Alibaba and Tencent. And um, today, uh, you could pay anything with, uh, with your phone. And your phone also becomes the, the, the point of sale for almost any transaction, uh, in the sense that I don't carry cash anymore uh, anywhere. I just need to make sure that my battery is charged. Um, when, uh, and, and when I mean anywhere, I really mean anywhere. I, if you go to the wet market to buy to buy vegetables, um, then you, the, the, the salesperson would just point you to, um, to the QR code on the sign and, and you just uh, you scan that and sometimes you even win a raffle while, uh, while paying. So yeah, it, it, it is an amazing, uh, uh, it, it's so difficult actually. Now I'm coming and, and I'm originally from Tel Aviv and I come here and I have to take money in my pocket. It's just <laughs> so bizarre. But, uh, and in, in a way, it also leapfrogged the whole, um, the whole credit card thing because it's complementing the, the, the credit card, uh, um, the increased penetration of credit cards because your, fintech, your, your, your uh, WeChat account is connected to your credit card. So you don't need to take your credit card out of your pocket. You just scan your phone. And, uh, and that's the way it is. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, uh, you have a very unique experience in the area of uh, InsurTech, which is a subset of uh, our topic here. So uh, we, would you be kind to share this experience and also touch the point of whether we see new players or just serve the, as Amber said, just serve the uh, current players? I think it's actually quite similar to what Jay said, at least from my experience, meaning, um, Displacing existing, um, existing players would probably be quite difficult, but you do see uh, the rise of new significant competitors into the old marketplace. We've um, supported uh, a couple of interesting uh, clients, uh, uh, starting from direct insurance in Israel. You know, I think before it was even described or defined as insurtech or, or, or fintech, uh, just starting to, to do insurance over the phone and then online and, and, and so forth. And then you saw the entire market uh, um, challenged and, and, and trying to, to offer new products or at least new, new ways of acquiring the product and, and marketing it uh, to match this new young uh, 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 fierce competitor. And no insurance company went under as a result of that, but you do have uh, uh, a new, uh, very formidable uh, competitor in the marketplace. Um, another client of ours, like uh, I don't, people I think here know about David Shield and Passport Card, offering travel insurance in a card-based 
uh, uh, man uh, eliminating deductibles and so forth. Again, uh, um, it's not as if existing insurance companies stopped selling travel insurance, but you do have a new uh, um, offering and a new, uh, uh, a new product or a similar product with, with new characteristics, uh, but it does not displace the existing players. Um, we can even see that, that uh, for example, this, this uh, uh, passport card solution is, is, um, is now marketed in Germany based on, on, on agreements with, with Allianz that, that we've made. So a very, a very traditional, uh, 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 some would say old-fashioned company understands the, the uh, power of, of uh, this new offering or the, the new methods that technology could bring and, and tries to leverage it uh, for, for, for its own uh, benefit. Um, and I think, uh, I expect this to go into the future. We, we see um, an, interest, an interesting new startup doing um, blockchain-based or smart contract-based uh, insurance for flight cancellations, etc. This is something that seems very uh, appropriate due to the, um, how, immediate, uh, how immediately uh, um, it, uh, algorithm would be able to ascertain whether or not uh, uh, the insurance uh, 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 event had occurred and then on that you can uh, immediately base the, the, the payment through a smart contract. But again, I don't expect that to, to uh, uh, eliminate other uh, flight cancellation or travel related insurance products. Uh, but such a company could uh, turn out to be very successful and become a, a serious contender in the marketplace. Thank you. Uh Eitan, from a regulatory point of view, we sometimes see two different goals of the regulator when it comes to the financial services. Firstly, is to preserve the solidity of the market, and secondly, is to open the market uh, for a new competition. In a sense, those two goals are contradicting, and in Israel, uh, it was seen through the differences between the Bank of Israel, which was the regulator of banks, which was against any new competitors in the market, at least, uh, at least uh, in essence, not, not, not maybe uh, uh, in words or uh, explicitly, but uh, implicitly this was the, the direction. And on the other hand, we have seen the Minister of Finance from the era of uh, the current uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Kahlon, that he forced the uh, other regulators to open the market uh, to new competition against outcry of the current uh, regulators and current uh, market player that this will bring uh, s some uh, new risk uh, to the market because competition can uh, harm the profitability and then the uh, equity of the players and against and, and of course uh, it will uh, affect the solidity of, of the players so in your view what is the right policy here how do you open the market for competition without uh, risking the uh, solidity of the uh, existing players? So I think in the, in the U.S., I think one of the, the challenges has been that uh, the regulators are a bit schizophrenic about this, this point. Uh, you know, on one hand, you have the major banking regulators, the major financial services regulators. Every single one of them has something called something like the Office of Innovation, the lab, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the CFTC, which is a derivatives uh, and swaps regulator, has lab CFTC. The OCC has the Office of Innovation. Uh, the CFPB has Project Catalyst. So they, they talk this very positive game about, uh, about, you know, encouraging competition, encouraging innovation. Uh, but what you dig, you know, the next layer deep, most of what these offices do, they're just, they're talking to companies. And that's, I don't want to downplay that. That's important. They're having conversations, they're having conversations with both the banks and the technology companies, uh, looking at new solutions, looking at new ways of doing things. But one of the things I think that is really lacking in the US, uh, that for instance you have, I think 18 countries have this now, and particularly the UK, this notion of a regulatory sandbox. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's essentially uh, a, a test run for financial technology or regulatory technologies where a company can get a waiver or a no action letter from the regulator to run small tests with a kind of close eye from the regulator. Uh, 
by law, there is no structure in the U.S. And the regulators have actually said publicly, we can't do that. We have no authority to just waive uh, any legal requirements, to any, waive any regulatory requirements. And there has been some talk in the past in the U.S. about doing that. I think that is something where I think more and more people in the U.S. are thinking about and talking about. I think it would be quite a significant way of, of changing some of that dynamic by allowing financial technology firms, both independent financial technology firms and the banks, to experiment a bit more without the fear uh, of both the federal regulators, the state regulators, for those who don't know, with, we have a multi-tiered regulatory system in the U.S., as well as you know, class action litigation. We need a, we need a stronger legal system, a, legal, a more robust legal protection to allow a little bit more of that competition and that innovation to happen without that, that concern. Uh, I would like to follow up to the next question and uh, stay with you, Ethan. Uh, we, this is a national conference, uh, the conference of the uh, foreign firms. Uh, would you recommend an Israeli or uh, some other foreign uh, fintech company, fintech in the sense of offering services to the, com to the public, to try to offer its services in the U.S. at an initial stage in terms of uh, regulatory barriers, cost of compliance, and so on? So I don't want to say that. I mean, obviously, the U.S. is is an enormous market, and it's, it's the place where you want to be. Um, on the other hand, I think that the compliance challenges are significant, and that's on, on two fronts. The first is just right straight up the compliance challenges, the number of legal requirements that you have to figure out. You have to figure out who regulates me, what the regulations are, uh, and again, there's federal regulations, there are state regulators. It's, it's complex and it's expensive. And the second challenge is that if you are partnering or working with a bank, and as I think you know, Amber and others have pointed out, that is really in the U.S. where fintech is going to be. It's going to be uh, primarily, ex except in a few places where the banks have signed a seeded ground, like small dollar lending, you're, you're most likely going to be working closely with a large financial institution. They are going to look to you to have the, almost the level of compliance that they have. Because in the U.S., the banking regulators essentially have a concept of third-party risk. You can't outsource liability. And so if you're working with a financial technology partner, if they don't have the level of compliance that you as a banking or financial institutions have, that's going to roll back on you. And so those are the two reasons why in the U.S. The, the level of compliance for a small financial technology firm is probably more, much more significant than I think in other areas. And then I think the third is that there is no concept of kind of a regulatory sandbox and a test. So I wouldn't say that you shouldn't come to the U.S., but I would say that the, the awareness of the, compliant, the level of compliance that you need to have, the legal thinking that you need to be put into this, and the time and effort and the expense that you're going to have to put into this in order to be in the U.S. to avoid regulatory enforcement and even to get a bank to take a second look at you is quite high. Uh, Jacob. A uh, more practical question. As uh, lawyers, we're dealing with clients here in Israel or uh, whenever. And today, each client, mostly in the uh, high-tech area, is, has a dream about being global. How do you treat a client, uh, an Israeli client who uh, approaches you and asks for services? And from the beginning, you have to, uh, to have a strategy of uh, global expanding. How, how we, as a local firm, can we give him the right, uh, the right service, or and how do we handle the situation? Well, I, I can answer like we answer uh, when clients ask us. Of course we can, and then we go ahead and, and start to see how it's going to be done. Uh, but seriously, um, sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. But, uh, but mostly, uh, when we know of, of um, a client that really does have a plan uh, to go abroad. Uh, many times we find ourselves uh, creating a team. Um, I've just these days I've been approached by, by one of Israel's largest IT players and they're going to partner with a local uh, uh, player that's very, uh, who's very strong uh, um, globally uh, in the blockchain cryptocurrency arena and they want to create uh, a blockchain based solution uh, for shipping, uh, uh, letters of credit, uh, bills of laden, possibly other logistical issues. Um, uh, this is clearly going to be, if, if it ever uh, 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 succeeds, this is clearly going to be a global enterprise. Um, the players involved 
One is purely Israeli, the other is based in Israel, but uh, incorporated as a Swiss foundation, as you see often in these cases. Um, and immediately questions like where this new venture would be incorporated and where uh, uh, will it actually uh, uh, operate and uh, so forth, such questions arise immediately. So uh, these are questions that we don't think we can answer without the support of colleagues from, from overseas. And we have uh, uh, connections through all sorts of, 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 of uh, uh, affiliations and networks and past experiences. Um, some especially um, some especially built for the purpose of meeting the new challenges of the blockchain age. So we have people in Gibraltar and in Switzerland and, and in other places to, to address uh, uh, potential issues that are, uh, uh, do with uh, um, places where regula uh, regulation, uh, regulatory uh, uh, considerations are easier uh, uh, and, and, and tax regimes and, and, and so forth. Um, and and um, we bring these people on board quite uh, early in the process. However, usually we manage the process for our clients. So that, that goes for obviously everything that has to do with the terms of the engagement between the partners, uh, uh, the founders agreement or whatever kind of document that you put in place. Uh, the commercial negotiations, and also the overseeing of, of, of uh, uh, foreign firms. This is something that is not really uh, specific to fintech. We, we've done uh, uh, many M&A transactions where clients of, us, of ours went abroad to do deals and uh, preferred to have us as the quarterbacks of the, of the entire process. Having said that, there are occasions where um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to, to have the Israeli uh, uh, council intimately involved. Um, there are typical cases, I don't know, doesn't have anything to do with fintech, but if you do a simple real estate transaction in a place where you have proper law firms, not all places have them, but uh, most do, um, then typically it wouldn't make sense to have your, your uh, to, to pay your Israeli council as well. Uh, but in more complicated transactions where, uh, and, and with clients who have a uh, good rapport with you and you know what they want and they know how you work, um, especially when things are complicated and regulatory issues are, are there and, and, and also uh, uh, project related issues are there. You have to manage the legal project. Those cases it does make sense and, and it does happen quite often. Thank you, Tzach. Are, any gate, are there any gates in the uh, big wall through which we can penetrate the China market? Um, well, I mean, the, the focus of Great our, wall, I mean, yeah. Well, the Great Wall, this the is great the... Great Wall, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there are gates in the Great Wall, and if you look at the, at the history of it, the, the Great Wall did not, uh, did not stop invaders because it's all, only as strong as uh, whoever is guarding it. Is this is the answer also for us? No. <laughs> Well, they're, they're pretty strong guards right now. But actually, I mean, and again, to echo previous uh, questions, there has been talk about uh, regulatory sandbox in China. Um, from my perspective, it looks more like a beach. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I would call it a sandbox. Um, and uh, when it comes to foreign investment in China, um, uh, generally, and more specifically, uh, in the financial sector, um, foreign companies are not treated the same as local companies. Um, there are actually different legal structures for companies uh, which are uh, invested by foreigners. They're, they're known as foreign invested enterprises. On top of that, any company that you open in China needs to have a very defined business scope. You cannot open a company for any legal purpose which means that they, at the incorporation stage, you already need to decide exactly what you're going to do. And you cannot just write whatever you want either. It needs to fall into certain rubrics that the local um, administration of industry and commerce would recognize. Now, this means that the, the, the corporate system, even before we get to the other regulatory issues, is very rigid. And it's not well suited to companies with a disruptive uh, business model. 
Um, the second hurdle that you need to pass is, is also as a foreign investor is the fact that there are certain sectors that are closed to you. There are certain things that you cannot do in China. And to add to that, there are uh, foreign exchange controls, uh, which make it very difficult to do business on a cross-border basis. Um, and there are, um, there are new regulations now regarding cybersecurity, uh, which are also, uh, not everything is actually, uh, has been published yet, but the direction is very clear that um, you, foreign players are required to localize their, um, uh, their uh, structure in China. It's very difficult to do, uh, to do things in China from, on remote control. You, you really need to be there. Um, in terms of, of uh, um, operations of foreign companies, it's, as I said, it, it doesn't feel like there's a level play, playing field. Um, so it pays for foreign uh, companies to work with local, um, with local banks or local uh, uh, affiliates. That sometimes can help get over some regulatory hurdles. Um, and um, you just have to really do your homework before you get into this market. Um, because if you come up with a business model that works somewhere else, it would not necessarily be possible in China. Thank you. Uh, Jay, do you master the uh, securities law of Micronesia? Well, well, not quite. When I wake up in the morning, I say to myself, gee, what's going on in the uh, local laws of the United States, Canada, BVI, Cayman, UK, EU, Israel, Singapore, Hong Kong? So, first out, thing you Out of 186 nations in the world? No, this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I it's a good start. This. And, and really the concerns, though, that we have to deal with are on two levels. There's the level of compliance and there's a the level of structuring deals. And we have to be able to have expertise in both. And also you need to, to learn a whole set of, of abbreviations. Because we deal with AML, KYC, GDPR, AIFMD, MIFID, UVECA. We got it just to name a few. So, the first, the way you deal with it is you have a great team, and my colleagues are here, most of my colleagues are here, and we have a great team, and we were able to deal with these challenges. You need to have legal experts that are local, because there's no way I'm going to know the answer to all these questions. You know, I th when I'm asked, how come you don't know the answer, I said, well, gee, we have a law firm in New York that's got a partner that just does the 40 Act, and you want me to know everything about everything. So it, it doesn't really work that way. But I'm developing expertise. We're in the middle of a whole data privacy uh, initiative to get that done in, in office, and we're using an outside counsel for that. We're trying to figure out how to operate in Europe, in the EU. And so we're applying for a license through the UK, despite Brexit, and seeing how that's going to work. So I would say today that the regulatory environment is extremely challenging. To make it worse, the EU, uh, what you find is they have what are called directives. And what a directive means is that they, so the EU says, this is what we suggest you should do. And then each country puts a wrapper around it. So if you go to the UK, you're usually in pretty good shape. But if you go to places like Germany, they've got a whole other layer you have to deal with. And this is, what, this is sort of the puzzle that we, we deal with on every day. This is what we're trying to put together. Uh, it's not easy, but it's definitely not boring. <laughs> Amber, uh, with a very impressive transactional portfolio in your CV, uh, can you uh, share with us an uh, interesting experience of uh, cross-jurisdictional uh, M&A transaction uh, which involve financial services or uh, fintech in particular? Um, well, putting aside some very interesting, like I think I once got an invitation with no warning to a call at 4 a.m. I was getting out of my car at 2.15 in the morning and suddenly looked down at my email and there was an invite for a call at 4 a.m. So um, I always laugh when people say they want to do cross-border international work. Um, you know, <laughs> more productively, I mean, I'm seeing a ton of investment in fintech in developing countries and um, actually do pro bono work for um, Axion International, which is a micro lender, and they have a, uh, a fintech arm that just does seed financing for fintech companies that are trying to reach underbanked, underserviced areas. Um, and 
I'm seeing a lot of that both in the nonprofit and pro bono world, but also um, you know, US and European investors who are looking at saturated markets and high multiples. Um, and they are seeing a lot of opportunity, um, particularly in Africa and Latin America, um, which has fewer of the restrictions than China does. Um, and I think you know, some of the earlier questions as to why China is adopted and why some of these other countries have more pervasive payment systems and such than we do in, in the US or Europe or Israel um, is there's really a, a need that's not being serviced, whereas we have existing infrastructure and existing services. And so it takes a while to displace, adopt, upgrade that. Um, but you know, I was working with a nonprofit that was in, uh, there, here's my interesting anecdote, um, uh, contact who was handling the project finance money in South Sudan for nine months last year. Um, and if anyone is paying attention to the banking system in South Sudan, it's non-existent. Um, the inflation is changing on a minute by minute basis. And so she was working for a gigantic international nonprofit. And every week she walked around the country with a briefcase full of money because that was the only way they could fund the various projects. Um, and that's actually one of our clients that is looking into alternatives for electronic and mobile payment to make that safer um, and to also make it less prone to inflation, make their project management easier and help their donators. Uh, I would like to continue with you, Amber, to the next topic, which is the ICOs. Is it a trend or this is the promise for the future? So if you are any, uh, if the ICO is a part in your daily uh, daily practice, do you have any? Uh, uh, have you seen some transactions going on, or just something that we read in the newspaper, or from time to time having one or two clients trying to uh, find their way into this market? So this is dangerous because this is being recorded, right? <laughs> um, Certainly not the formal opinion of the firm or anybody else. I think it's a trend. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah. nobody's <laughs> off the record. Yeah. I, I think it's a trend. Um, you know, I do get an enormous amount of inbound calls. We do as a firm. We probably, um, you know, my colleague Mike Minahan in the, um, in the audience there, our colleague Grant Fondo at West, we probably talk to a dozen different people every few weeks asking what ICOs are, what blockchain is, what Bitcoin is. Um, you know, how they form a fund. And we've done a fair amount of work in that area, but nothing compared to the amount of inbound inquiries and people who really, frankly, don't understand what it is. Um, I, I think ICOs are a trend. I think blockchain is a more permanent structure that we're going to see deployed in a lot more areas of fintech, and that could be a lasting infrastructure. I see. Uh, Jay, uh, in terms of our crowds, do you view the ICO as a legitimate uh, way to raise money? Do you have in your portfolio some companies that raise money through ICOs? First of all, I'm, con I'm convinced if you're over 30, you have no idea what's going on. So I have, we have a, guy, a young guy in the office who's the one who's been mentoring me on this. <laughs> but I feel, like, I feel like I'm back in the 90s and the internet bubble, and I'm hearing, when you hear ICO, you think about eyeballs and hits, and, and, that, and that's what you start to think about at times in this model, because I think we're really in the hype cycle of this. I think there, this is something that's going to stay, I think for the long term. I think, first of all, the regulators have to figure this out so that this becomes a market that's more secure, that people will feel better about investing in it. You know, if you're going to invest in a cryptocurrency or in an ICO, and you're going to see valuations fluctuate by 50, 70, 89 percent over a daily or weekly period, it's very difficult to, to call that a mature market. But on the other hand, I agree with Amber that I think that blockchain is here to stay, and I think there's some really, really good applications. And that could be in the fintech side, whether it's even just this KYC AML could be very, very helpful. The, I think when it realizes its promise of uh, verifying transactions it's going to be a very very good thing but I think they're met we're seeing some very interesting use cases coming up now because we're seeing a lot of uh, over the last few months we're seeing some very interesting um, proposals and you can see them in supply supply chain management uh, digital identity digital digital rights it is a big issue and I think there there really are very good cases for this I think we're starting to see it and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll start seeing the real, the real um, cycle coming in. Although, 
Today, in my personal opinion, I'm still very skeptical on, on cryptocurrencies, but I think on those two, with ICOs, we will see the right use cases coming up. Thank you. Tsak, China? China in the ICOs? Do you have any experience? Do you see any ICOs in China? Uh, ICOs have recently been banned in China. And um, also, uh, banks have been discouraged from, uh, from um, facilitating uh, uh, trading in, uh, in cryptocurrencies. Uh, and yet, the market is very, very hungry. Um, and so, I, I think I can see why it's been banned and, and why the, the uh, where the, the, the fear is from, from the government side because it's, uh, China is very, very protective of, um, of its, uh, you could say, its currency border of not letting renminbis out. Even if a renminbi exists outside of China, it, it changes its name from CNY to CNH. It's like a different currency almost. Um, and, um, and this, and all, all of a sudden, the cryptocurrency throws everything out of whack. You don't know what's happening anymore. Um, there is a lot of appetite for, uh, for cryptocurrency, maybe for the wrong reasons, maybe just out of uh, sheer love of uh, speculative uh, investments. Um, we do see um, some Chinese players looking for uh, offshore destinations to, um, um, for ICOs. And uh, um, as, as I actually, I work for a Swiss law firm, uh, we do see some movement from China to Switzerland in that, uh, in that sense, and uh, also Singapore and, uh, and other centers. Thank you. Jacob, uh, should ICO be treated as an IPO? or a public offering in terms of uh, securities law? I'll allow myself to ignore that for a second because we heard, uh, um, I think, two people uh, noting the, the, the quite common um, opinion that, and pardon my French, uh, that cryptocurrency is bullshit but blockchain is real. Uh, and I think there's a certain uh, logical flaw there because blockchain and smart contracts would need cryptocurrency. So, so um, while there certainly is a hype and there certainly is a trend, I think that cryptocurrency is here to stay. It's here to stay not necessarily in the manner that, that it's here now. And certainly uh, uh, there are quick, quick entrepreneurs um, leveraging the window of opportunity uh, not necessarily in the most positive sense of the word. Uh, and and uh, that window of opportunity certainly has to do with the fact that there are very few regulatory constraints at the moment. Uh, but eventually when, when blockchain, and that does seem to be the consensus, uh, is a, a, a technology that's leveraged uh, in many applications and by many corporations, and smart contracts are, are, are uh, broadly used at, at that point in time, cryptocurrency would have to be uh, 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 available and used by, by these applications. Um, so that's, I just had to say something about that. As for whether uh, an ICO is, is uh, basically an IPO in disguise, uh, to a certain extent it is, and I, I think that eventually it's likely that ICOs will be regulated and uh, will be regulated in a way that would be somewhat similar to the way IPOs are regulated. You have all sorts of exchanges and all sorts of, of uh, 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 markets uh, for, for securities with different uh, regulatory uh, uh, requirements. And you know, during the, the, those 90s or a little afterwards, uh, you saw the rise of all the Neuermarts and Ames and so forth. So, so in that regard, they'll probably have some sort of a, a securities regulation solution that would be uh, uh, better uh, uh, suited for, for, for the ICO world. But the mo more interesting thing there, I think, is uh, um, will the, the, the new concept of funding that ICO uh, uh, brings, will that uh, 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 be sustainable? Because 
Uh, it's not uh, regulatory issues with, which will eventually be solved that, that, that uh, interest me. It's the fact that you have a new paradigm for raising investments without giving your investor, for lack of another word, um, any, any uh, uh, claim on your uh, corporation, nor to the creditor, nor to the shareholder, not uh, uh, granting him any uh, sort of rights. And, and this, uh, this does seem uh, like an interesting concept. Um, I, I think there's a good chance that uh, uh, it will survive. Uh, it's, it's similar to other new age uh, 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 funding uh, solutions like uh, uh, um, uh, Kickstarter and things like that. You are able, all of a sudden, by, by virtue of, of someone's thought and, and introduction of a new solution, you're able to raise funds in a different manner. You're able to sell your products before you even develop them, uh, get the funds and, 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 and fund your organization without uh, uh, granting any sort of rights to, to uh, uh, the, the, the acquirers of this uh, product to be. Um, a same idea, the same, the same kind of thought may be applied to ICOs and that's, I think, the, the real novelty. The last question, Eitan. Uh, you have the uh, right of the last word and you try to, uh, to sum it up. Uh, you get up in the morning and then you have a new client, which is a nice thing, and there is a new, uh, new idea. Blockchain, think about a few years ago, or some new service. And we as a practitioner in an uh, industry which is sometimes very traditional, how do we handle that? How do we find the answers for new technology but there are no clue in the existing precedents, existing uh, law books? How do we handle that? So uh, you should hire a good lawyer. Uh, so it's a self-promotion here for the panel. No, I, th I think, I think the, uh, the, the challenge there is uh, and I'm actually serious about that. I think I think what you know in the U.S. what what you need are are people who've kind of seen the cycles before, who understand how the regulators are going to apply the old or the existing precedents, and and by that I mean both uh, some of the legal, the more formal technical rules uh, where it's a little bit easier, as well as some of the more standard-based uh, applications of law. So whether it's safety or soundness principles or principles of unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices. You need people who uh, have, have seen it and have experienced it with other new companies and can analyze uh, where the risks are. Um, and, and frankly, for, the, for many of the rules, you just need to have someone who can literally walk through everything. So, and, I, and I've done this with clients. You know, we've, we've, been, we've done a review for a client where you know, we've, we've been asked by a regular to review certain products and you're literally just taking out the book and going down one by one and saying, you know, does EFTA apply? Does TILA apply? Does FCRA apply? And you just have to, you know, it's, it's painful. Um, but that's, that's what you need to do. That's what companies need to do. And I think, you know, one important thing is, is you know, you had asked before about kind of, you know, entering the U.S. market. I think one of, you know, one of the important things, and it's probably true in, in every market, is you need a, companies at an early stage, you know, often are very product focused. And what they need, but companies really need to get religion about compliance early. You need to build that into the DNA. And as a lawyer, you need to be talking to companies about that from the beginning because you don't want to go, and someone said kind of, you know, mar things that don't work in every single market. I think you, you don't want to be too far down the road and find out that you've built a product, that your clients built a product that can only go in one direction. Um, you need to be thinking about that from the beginning. So, you know, I'm serious. You, you need to hire the good lawyers, the people with experience, the people with experience in, in each of these local markets who can help you walk through those issues, who can help you tell you where things have been, what the regulators will think of a new product, and, you know, think about the historical analogs um, and the specific rules and how they apply. Okay. Eitan, Amber, Jay, Tzach, and uh, Jacob, thank you very much.